<laughs> this is the ring. We actually stole it off of a grandma outside, so it is an heirloom. Okay. <laughs> so here's the thing, Troy. Earlier, when Adam and Aaron were in the green room, Adam asked her some questions. We're gonna play one back for you now, and if you can guess her answer, the ring is yours. Let's check out the question. Would you rather have Troy be 500 pounds or $500,000 in debt? What do you think she'll say? Uh, I think we're already in debt, so I think she would be okay with a little bit more debt. Uh, so I think she would rather me be in debt than weigh 500 pounds. You're already comfortable with the debt. I mean, it, it is what it is at this point, right. so. So you think your answer is that she would rather you be $500,000 in debt? Yes. Now remember, as long as you get this next question right, the ring is yours to keep no matter what, okay? Let's check out the answer. Would you rather have Troy be 500 pounds or $500,000 in debt? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Look at this. Is this so dysfunctional that I brought my dog? No, oh, please, like always. Building. Blanche. OK, cool. Let's try to conduct the interview while Blanche just sort of wanders I around. Well, that's how we do the show. If you watch enough episodes, you'll see her just sort of weaving through the audience. It's a professional show. What did, what, what did she answer? The clip ended. What did she answer? I, I don't know. I know I'm supposed to know that. Whichever one was the nicer one is what she answered. I didn't even hear. I was eating Starburst so loud in that green room. It was 500 pounds or B. Was it half a million dollars in debt? I think she's, I don't remember. I'm sorry. I know that's bad. Nobody showed it to me ahead of time. You know how many of these we shot? And it was like eight months ago. So give me a break. How many did you shoot? Like, not that many. No, I'm just kidding. It was, <laughs> like six? It was, a, it was a couple months ago, so uh, I don't remember, but the... That was a good one. It was a good what would you? What would you say? Would I want my partner to be partner? It would be a boy. I, I just debt. give off a lesbian vibe. I'm not a lesbian. Uh, <laughs> wrong city for that joke. What? Debt or, or weight? Probably 500 pounds. 500 pounds is a lot. Yeah, you could die. So I have to be like, say the good answer and be like, I'd want you to be in debt because otherwise you could die. Now, is 50 pounds overweight, I would say that I'd want... Nope, still 50 pounds. I would say 50 pounds overweight. Yeah, because that you could shed easier. I'm not coming off good, am I? <laughs> what would you, let's I mean, flip it, a, what would you pick, Mr. Perfect? There's a Mr. reason Perfect? that you bring a cute dog with you everywhere at the moment, Eliza. Uh, the reason is because some questions are loaded and I'm like sweating into this bodysuit. What would you pick? What would you want your partner, media outlet person, from something like probably super influential, you probably like a trillion Twitter followers. And you're like, she was sassy to me and I did not like it being flipped. No, would you pick? See, it's hard. Can I curse on this? You would pass? Fucking hard. You can't pass. You're on a game show. You have a quarter of a million dollars at stake. How stressful is this? It's fucking really stressful. Yeah. And I'm like all this fake hair and makeup looking right at you, but like not helping you, but like still on your side. Yeah. It's hard. Welcome to Separation Anxiety. She doesn't have an answer. And that is the show. That's the show. It's just me bullying people <laughs> right before we give them a lot of money. <laughs> it's a hard question. Is it really? Yeah. I don't find... Because whatever answer you give, you could look like a monster. And you also know that you're on TV. She knew she was on TV. So she wants to give a good answer, and it also comes into, you know, do you want your spouse to die, or a partner to die, or do you want to be in I guess debt? I'm personally just okay with looking like a monster at What's times. What's your answer? Honest. Oh, debt. Please. You want the debt. I want the debt. Uh, but here's the question. 500 pounds, and you fall in love with them as is, or they're thin, and then they gain the 500, like, that day. That's a totally... That day. That's an existential <laughs> dilemma, yeah. We pump you full of fluids. And we leave you like a blueberry in Willy can Wonka. I, can I add to this dilemma? Can we say $500,000 in debt or 500 pounds overweight, but $500 million rich? Yeah, let's add more numbers to the equation. The debt won't matter. We know that $500 million will cancel that out. Then you don't need to come on separation anxiety. What do you need $250,000 for if you're $500 million richer? Wait, no. <laughs> I'm saying if they're 500 sure pounds right. overweight, they're also very rich. Would you choose a... They don't do pounds anymore. It's the euro. No, they do the pounds. Sorry. Did you do the <laughs> They do the pounds. I, I'm very tired. Eliza, how did you, uh, how did you get this Separation show? anxiety, Tuesdays. <laughs> 10 p.m. on TBS. She hates me now. That's fine. How did, you, how did you become a game show host? I became a game show host. Uh, they asked me to do the show. They called and they said, we have this great idea. Five by Five Media said, we've got this great idea for a game show. And I was like, thanks, bye. And then they were like, let's have a meeting. And I was like, okay. And the words that came out of their mouth that were important were, you're allowed to make this your own. And we want this to be funny. And especially for stand-up comedians, you know, the objective is to get to be as funny and as big on as many platforms as possible. So you say, you get to do a game show on TBS. 
There are no rules. We're here to make it funny and do what you want. You can dress yourself. Huge mistake. And, uh, and so I said yes. And they really, I mean, you see, we, we got Adam Ray, who's super funny, and he's a good friend of mine. He adds a lot of comedy to it. So we just wanted to do something that was irreverent and fun. And the twist of one person not knowing what's at stake, there's no other show like that. Also, aside from Hollywood Game Night, which I love, there's no other shows hosted by women that are game shows. That's true, and so now Jane Lynch and I are sworn enemies. I'm just kidding. I'm on Hollywood Game Night this month. <laughs> tweet, tweet at her. Tweet, t- I'm going to death threat Lynch. until she tweets back. Were you worried going into it, though? At the top, they said, you know, you can make this funny, you can make this what you want, but that's in the development process, and then you get on set, and there could be an executive there who's like, could you tone it down a little? Could be. No, uh, there, that has happened to me before, and especially as an artist, because... It's a collaborative process, and especially stand-up is so contingent upon my thoughts and what I'm thinking, and it's all about me. I don't have to consult with anyone. Anytime you're making a movie or TV or anything, you're beholden to someone else's input, and ultimately the highest executive gets to make the call. She's so into it. It's just the cutest thing in the world that we're talking. And, and no, it's good to distract from the most important answer I've given, to look right at the dog. Uh, <laughs> and so, so, yeah, there was that worry that you give them all these, as we say in the comedy world, gems, and then you watch the edit, and it's literally just me being like, welcome back, and then just asking the questions. Uh, and I've had that happen. So I think that the creators knew how important it was to me that it gets, gets to be funny. I also don't think you would hire me if you just needed a blonde girl to read a cue card, because there are plenty of more attractive women out there that can do that job flawlessly. So go slightly uglier and get some funny, or hire a model who can read a cue card. There are no cue cards. I insisted upon that. No cue cards. I had, the, I had a gut reaction there when you said there are more attractive women to like it's it's my gut reaction like no there's not oh, but then it would have thrown the of course whole thing there are off, and I'm sorry if I'm the most attractive woman then where's my modeling contract yeah if I'm the most attractive woman why did I spend an hour in hair and makeup this morning no I should have just rolled out like let's do it you look great you look I great I look great but not as great as some but better than some others right <laughs> remember girls there's always someone uglier but always someone hotter. So that's a worried? balance. Life's about balance and breathing. Were you worried that you were just accidentally pointing at someone? And that's I was. I was literally really looking fast? at the horizon of the room to make sure that it didn't look like I was pointing at anyone in particular, which finger. is a trick to stand up because the most insecure girl in the room would be like, and then she looked right at me and my hook, and I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't looking at anyone. When you do a show like this, how much of your stand-up do you bring into it? Do you write it all beforehand, or do you try to keep the stand-up completely separate? Do you not want to sort of test material or lose material on the show? It's neither. These are two totally different animals. I mean, I am standing and joking around with people, but my stand-up is its own thing. This is all off the top of my head. And I'm not bragging, but that is a skill set of mine. And when I hosted the dating show that I hosted, I hosted a show called Excuse, for two years, if any of you had a severe cocaine problem and were awake in the 3 a.m. hour watching my show, (laughs) you saw it. Uh, But what made that show, I'm reticent to say a cult hit, but popular was, it was all off the cuff and it was all making fun of people, none of it was scripted. And this, they wanted to tap into that. So any of the asides, all the jokes, it's all just organically done. Very rarely do we do a second take. Obviously the gameplay is scripted because I legally have to say certain things to make it a game show, but yeah, they wanted just, it's like a giant episode of crowd work. Um, and I think that those are the best moments. And I think audiences value that and can tell when you're being genuine versus reading something scripted. Is it hard to compartmentalize uh, your stand-up versus doing a, a, another show that has its own rules and its own standards that you have to sort of abide by? Like, you spend so long, so many hours of your life sort of bringing together a, a routine and bringing together a certain body of work that represents you as a stand-up and then the lead up or the, the major success that comes from that is doing a show, getting a show. And so often that show isn't entirely representative of everything you've sure. been working towards. Is it hard to compartmentalize? You mean in terms of rage or you mean in terms of like, how do you mean compartmentalize? I mean, you end up getting the show and it sounds like you get to do what you want on this show for the I'll most part. I'll put it part, this way. But right. I'll put it this way. Entertainment is so hard. And being an actor is so, so hard. If I was just an actor and I didn't have stand-up, like, I would have booked one gig to date and I would live with my parents. So to look at people who have shows, you know, to get to a level where you're like a Louis, for example, and you're getting to say exactly what you want on your show, it, took, it, takes, it takes so long to get to there and there's so many no's and there's so many passes. To get to the level where you're allowed to say what you want to say, you first have to go through so many levels where you're saying what other people kind of want you to say to make your opinion palpable, uh, palatable and 
to to make yourself popular, you know? So people always say things like street cred, like, oh, you did a commercial for the Hyatt, what about your street cred, and what about this? And it's like, I bought a house, and I get to tour and do stand-up comedy on my own terms, and this is all ancillary, and it's wonderful. Um, but to not take a gig on national television where you are getting to be yourself, even if you're not, even if you're doing a scripted show, people have very short memories, and it's always, what are you doing next? So unless it's coming out of porn, and even that I think people would forgive, uh, I think, or perhaps encourage, you know, there's no gig that's really beneath you. And especially getting to, the second they said you can make this funny, I was like, I'm so lucky. Because so many comics have to do the art of someone else. And so while it's not the highest art form, because it is comedy and it's a game show, I still got to be me. And I don't think I lost any integrity in that. And I, I don't think I would have at this level taken a gig where I felt I was losing any part of myself. Unless it was like so much money. <laughs> You would do the same thing, hooky. She's in the back. Uh, when it comes to the show, do you bring any of your own dating experiences into it at all? Do you, do you tell any stories about your, your dating life? Well, it's not a dating show. Um, so I don't bring any dating experiences. Relationship show. It's a relationship show. Uh, those two people were a couple, but we've had brothers, we've had sisters, we've had roommates. Um, I very much try, you know, my stand-up really taps into women and the way we communicate with men and personal stories. I think that women, it's very easy for women to look a little desperate and pathetic, especially in comedy. Sort of this go-to archetype of like, I'm single and it's hard. I'm just chugging wine. Who knows what's happening? And we've seen it a lot. That isn't who I am. That isn't who most women are. Most of us have it together and life has just failed us horribly. And so for this, I try to, you know, I think sometimes in being a strong woman, it comes off a little aggressive or people don't quite know how to compartmentalize that yet. So while I will share certain things or I'll make certain jokes, I really tried to represent for strong, successful women who are out there just trying to make people laugh and not make it look pathetic. How often do you feel like people try to cast single women as the sort of pathetic single woman looking for a date, looking for a man, looking for love? All day, every day. I go out for pilot season. I read these things like, mm, title, description, Chloe, she's 30, doesn't understand love, but loves drinking, has one night stands every day, and is afraid of men and relationships, but still fucks. Like, it's just this weird, it's like this amalgamation of women, and none of it's true. Like, most women, for the most part, you know, we... We do everything right, and we take care of ourselves, and we go to college, and we make money, and we're not, de you know, dependent on a man for something. Uh, but I think it's, you know, TV's about caricatures and characters, so I think it's funny and easier to do that. And I think we're getting to a place now where it's like, oh, she's not pathetic or drunk, and she's saying what she wants to say. And especially as the game show host, I'm in charge of the tone of that room. So if I come out really goofy, then the person who's playing doesn't take it that seriously, and then when I flip on them at the end and have to get serious, like, they kind of might not know what to do. So it's very important to uh, create how you want to be treated and hold yourself to a certain standard and not go below that. On top of the game show, you also started a podcast uh, recently, right? I do. A podcast called Truth and Eliza. Uh, it's, it's a podcast with opinions. That is my fourth grade running for class president slogan that I came up with. Podcast with opinions? The podcast with opinions. Meet me at the bake sale. Pizza every Friday if I'm elected. And it's a, it's, the premise of the podcast is I just wanted people to talk about things that they don't like. So many things about this world are about positivity. And Henry Rollins, and I'm pretty sure Hitler, uh, talked about how not, nothing brings people together, like a negative experience or a shared enemy. So it's literally anything from, please don't say that I quoted Hitler. Okay, I don't know if you're on my side yet. Uh, it's literally anything from airline grievances to everyday societal issues to a, uh, a, another celebrity, a story to get people talking about things that bug them and having those shared grievances with the world, then we build from there. It's not a celebrity interview story, you know. I've, had, I've been very fortunate to have some amazing guests. I've had John Cryer, I had Jay Leno, Diablo Cody, I had Jim Jeffries what on. Jay, what did Jay Leno not like? Was it like a certain sort of old T-model car or something that he was <laughs> upset with? And I was just like, sure. We had him on about a year ago, so I'd have to listen to it again. But with him, when you have a monster like that, a comedic legend on your podcast, you kind of just sit back and listen and listen to some stories. So some people, of course, I want to hear, like, whatever Jay Leno wants to talk about, we're going to talk about. Right. Um, but it's really just about, I started the podcast, I want to have my own late night show, and I started the podcast so I could work on my listening skills. Because as a comedian, you don't have to listen, you just have to talk. And I think a lot of times, comedians start podcasts so they can talk and be funny. And the trick is to be funny based off what the other person says and not have an agenda. 
Well, that's kind of something that you're doing with this show as well. Like you said, it's off the cuff. You're responding to the, you're setting the tone, but then you're responding to their reactions to the scenario that you're creating. You have to listen, and I'm a terrible listener. Uh, I had a boyfriend once who I couldn't listen to him talk because he, I thought he was dumb. And then... <laughs> that's not necessarily your fault. Oh, it's definitely not my fault. Not my fault at all. But I was just like, I feel so bad. I don't want to listen to him. And then I went out with someone who was much smarter than I. Uh, and I got done went going on a date. And I was like, ugh, I don't want to hear him talk anymore. And I realized I don't want to hear anyone talk. Like, I'm not guaranteed a punchline with you. I don't want to hear anything anyone has to say. Um, and so you have to work on it. With this, people can tell when you're doing the host thing. There's that great scene in Wayne's World, too, when they go, I can't believe it just reference Wayne's World, too. But they go to the radio thing, and he's talking, and he's saying, like, nothing, and the guy's like, uh-huh, uh-huh. Oh, yeah, yeah. I've done a, unfortunately, I had to do a lot Harry of morning Shearer press. in that? Is I, it, I no, it's no, it's not Harry Shearer, because I remember what the guy looked like. Uh, oh, I'm thinking of Paul Shearer. You might be right. Um, I've done a lot of morning press. Dan, so yeah. Now it's all, it's all Dan. to me. I'm so sorry. But it's that, no, but it's that listening, and especially when you're putting thought into your answers, like you're listening and we're being interactive. I was until you brought up Wayne's World 2, and now I'm just remembering that. I totally. In my head. Just sitting there like, what can I say? Handsome Dan, Harry Sh Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a trick in and of itself, and it's a skill that you have to work on to actively listen versus as they're talking, be thinking, like, wait, what did I want to say about that? And you'll find that those amazing comedic moments that you want to hold on to. They keep coming around. So, yeah, I miss what she said at the beginning, but if I just keep listening, there will be... God, I'm talking fast. There will be another thing to jump off of. If you're a funny person, you find those moments in anything. And especially with this, with what they're saying, sometimes it's so personal, and the reason they want to win the money is such a beautiful reason, whether it's for their family, a family member, or, or an altruistic cause. And so you need to really make it clear that you're with them and you're listening and you're on their side. Because people don't want to open up if they think you're just like, okay, we'll be right back. <laughs> like, they want you, you... It's a personal connection. Yeah. And that's part of comedy. Does anyone really need a good reason to win money, though? I mean, you should, people yeah. can just go on the show and be like, I just want the money. I just want money. You want the audience on your side, guys. You want the audience on your side. And that's a live audience there. There's, uh, like, about 100 people there. You want them cheering for you. You know, it's a shared experience. You want them yelling the answer. You want them to want you win. You can feel that energy. And if you're coming up there and you're like, I don't know, I just want the money so I can go to a beach, get drunk, get high. It's like, yeah, but the group that we recorded before, like, they needed the money to open up a school. <laughs> you know? And so we all need money to go on a beach and get drunk all day, but we don't want to hear that version of the story. Find a way to, you know, PR it up. Make a, go to a beach where we'll help seals, you know, something like that. And when you get there, who knows what the seals do? But it might help seals for a day or something. Maybe. But really just maybe if the, the seals beach. want to drink. But, you know, it's, and it's nice, you know, part of American TV, reality TV is, well, American reality TV is terrible. We want to see how ugly you can get, and then we build you back up. With this, we want to hear your stories. And part of my job is to get those stories out of you. Why do you really, and we have fun at the first half. And I'm like, why do you really need this money? What was 50,000, uh, 100,000, we get up there. What does that mean to you? And of course, like, it's a lot for my family, but then they really get into it on some of these. And you see the sort of, I don't know, the, the personalization and how touching it is. And these are Americans, and this is an American story, and it's American TV, and you're listening to your <laughs> countrymen. Who am I right now? Uh, <laughs> it was really touching. We, we even had some servicemen on the show, and that's not the episode, but it was really touching to see him play. And it, you want people to succeed. It's in our spirit, our human spirit, to see people do well. So you want to be with them every step of the way. And if they come up like, I just want to buy a giant bong, you're like, whatever. You can make one at like Home Depot for like $10. <laughs> I'd be with the guy who wants to buy the giant, just for the sake of his honesty. So when you see a homeless guy that's got a sign that's like, God bless, need money for food, and then you see the one that's like, need money for beer and hookers, who are you giving the money to? Yeah, but you also want your spouse to be like 500 pounds, so like whatever. <laughs> if, if she has $500 million, she can be 500 pounds. <laughs> you're like, I'll, I'll fuck anyone. <laughs> Anyone with money is right, money. right, with money. Sorry, there's the caveat that makes you exemplary. I think we have uh, time for audience questions. Anyone have any questions out here in the Hookie? audience? Hookie, where is she? Hi. Hi, Hookie. No, Hookie. Hi. So, um, part of this show involves hearing a lot of stories, like you talked about. When you go on the show, do you know the full background of the two people that you're meeting? When it, I go yeah, on the show, is it like a surprise? Like, do you, do you for know? For me personally? Yeah. No, yeah. I, I know. I mean, they're screened. We also, the producers do a great job. You want to make sure the people there are, you, you, 
they don't know what they're getting into and you can't tell them, but you want to screen their personalities to make sure they've got a good story and they're fun, you know? So I find, I know ahead of time for the opening monologue what their background is. And then of course, if something special is going to happen in the episode, I'm aware of that, which is hard because I hate keeping secrets. I want to be like, guess what's going to happen to you? Um, and then halfway through, sometimes it's a surprise, but for the most part, I'm told, you know, this person's father died. They want the money so they can bury him. That's never been a story, but it's something personal. So I know enough that I know where not to step in terms of questioning them and what secrets to keep in, keep in and what not to say. And then the rest is all ad lib and funny. I know the serious stuff. Next question. Hi. Hi. Uh, I actually read that you used to work for Heavy.com. I actually used to work for them a couple years ago. I don't even remember. I wrote for them. You wrote for them. wrote for them. Yes. I did that. <laughs> I wrote a show. This is like all coming back to me as you're saying that. Yeah. This was like at the beginning of the boon of like websites doing their own content. Yeah, exactly. I think they paid me like so much and I would come in like so hungover. I was like 24 and I'd be like, I'm going to write your show. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I used to write like a new show. Is that a, they're around now. Yeah, They've been eaten around, up yeah. by Yahoo. Okay, yeah. they're real. Okay, by yeah. AOL. Oops. Uh, my, Great. My question is actually, uh, since you started off as a comedian, uh, was there any other um, comedians that you look, looked up to or anything? That I looked up to? So it's, when I started doing stand-up, I didn't know anything about stand-up. I had never heard. I'm, I live in L.A., and I started there, and I'm very proud of that. Uh, so growing up, you watch comedians like Roseanne, but you know that she has a show. I didn't think of her as a stand-up. You know, I'm from the suburbs of Dallas, Texas. I wasn't like a student of comedy. For me, it was watching the comics at the comedy store that I considered upperclassmen, someone like Joe Rogan or Sebastian, um, like Jim Jeffries would pop in there, people like that. And what's been so magical is the best way I can describe it is becoming an upperclassman and like now those are my contemporaries. Now those guys are monsters and they sell out and they're you know killers you on do stage. You too though. Sure, uh, but... It's just, if you had told me, and this is going to make him feel old, like when I was a kid, like, oh, by the way, you're going to be buddies with Joe Rogan. I'd be like, that's insane. Like, if, if you had told me all the people that I was going to consider my peers when I was younger, I, I, I wouldn't have believed you. So it was more about watching what they did and watching them destroy for an hour. And you're sitting there thinking, like, I've got a tight seven. Sure to hope I can stretch it. And then, uh, and then you're among them. Has Joe Rogan ever taken you to a UFC fight? He's never taken me, but I watched, and I'll tell you what, I was very disappointed in Holly Holm. Please don't find me, Holly. <laughs> uh, he's never taken me, but I do I enjoy, I enjoy his podcast, and I enjoy him as a human. <laughs> Next question. Hi, um, I just want to know if, of what your favorite game show is. My favorite game show? I'm assuming you watch them. You know what? Um, so I want to say Hollywood Game Night, because I'm on it. <laughs> got to get the date. We got to get that date down, guys, because I can't keep promoting it without knowing the date. Um, <laughs> I enjoy Jeopardy. I'm not a fan. I'm not like Rosie Perez and White Man Can't Jump. Uh, but uh, I have it on. If it's on, if, if I'm in a green room before a show and that's on, I very much enjoy it because I'm pretty good at that. It, you can stand outside in my green room and you can just hear me like, what is Mesopotamia? Like just from the outside. I like that. I, I like, I like ex uh, surprising myself with how much random knowledge, old world knowledge I have. Maybe Jeopardy. I think we have time for one more question. Hi. You. Hi. Do you all have microphones? Yes, we do. <laughs> okay. Um, so earlier you mentioned that audiences really root for the success of people on the show and how they succeed is, you know, they win, they earn a lot of money. So for yourself, how would you define success? At what point do you think that you would consider yourself to have made it? Never. Comedians can't do that. I am wired to hate myself. No. Um, <laughs> I think part of being a driven person, there is that fire in you. Um, to, like, even when I achieve goals, of course, my next thought is like, okay, well, so what? Like, you're happy for a second. So I guess the definition, definition of success for me, because I don't think being complacent will ever be an option, and I'm reticent to say that a career can define you, but I believe it does if that's your true love in your life. So the definition of success for me is getting to be as creative however you want, whenever you want, on whatever platform you want. And you know, a lot of times you see actors go do vanity projects or go do a play. That's because that's what feeds them creatively. So to have the luxury to step away from stand-up or from a movie or from a TV show and get to do whatever else I wanna do and A, not be financially worried about it but be, but be fed creatively, I think that's the definition of success. 
whatever leaves you smiling right as you go to bed. Unless you take like a lot of melatonin and you forget to smile. <laughs> <laughs> well, Eliza, the show premieres tomorrow? Tomorrow, you guys. At least set your DVR so it looks like you watched it for the ratings. Eliza, thank you so much for being thank here. Thank you. Thank you.